writing to the Corinthians, he writes, I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me, for I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Indeed, I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way, we have made this plain to you in all things. Or, did I commit a sin in humbling myself to you that, that you might be exalted because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you? God knows that I do. And what I am doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Let's pray again. Father, we recognize from your word that you are a God who is eager to communicate to people who are eager to hear. So I would ask you, Lord, just to prepare the soil of our hearts to receive what you have for us this morning. Fill this room with your presence. Quiet our minds quicken our hearts and our ears and allow us to be able to concentrate and to think clearly as your word is presented. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I have to let you know, I'm, I am a little bit frustrated this morning. I got to studying this passage and I got so full of things that I want to say. And, and so if at the end of it you're frustrated that I didn't get to something, I want you to know so am I. Um, all right, do me a favor. Hold up your hands like this and look at them, if you would, please. I know you got Bibles. Look at your hands. What do you see? Okay, fingers and rings. Wrinkles, creases, lines, friction lines. Anything else? Calluses. Did you know that the unseen life forms on your hands right now outnumber all the people alive on earth today? Yeah. Yeah, you have more microbes in you and on you than you have cells. Your body's made up of anywhere from 60 to 100 trillion cells, and you have more foreign life forms in you and on you than make you up. Now, as far as the realm of bacteria, I mean, humans for millennia were largely ignorant of this dangerous, unseen world. It wasn't until about 300 years ago that we became aware of germs. But even after we became aware of it, people were still skeptical. Scientists understood it. You know, people looking through their microscopes at all these little beasties cavorting about nimbly, if you remember biology and history. They, they knew they were there, but most people were like, mm, maybe, maybe not. In fact, it wasn't until about a century and a half ago until we realized just how dangerous this world was. Remember, just by ignoring or denying the existence of bacteria, 
does not make them go away, and it doesn't make them less dangerous. In fact, if anything, it makes them more dangerous. You can't just trickle a little bit of water over your hands and think you've dealt with the problem. No, you're going to have to get some warm water and some soap and spend some time in scrub to get rid of the majority of those problems. You're going to have to do things methodically and intentionally to keep the germs at bay. You know, I think it's something inside of us as humans. We, we think, because I can't see it, it's not there. It's like the little girl who covers up her face at the table and says, you can't see me. Right? Well, there is another unseen world of danger. A world that, for many Christians, they're reluctant to acknowledge its existence because we can't see it. Of course, that's the spirit realm all around us, especially the realm of darkness and demonic forces. Now, while we might have a hard time believing that they actually exist, Paul had no such problem. (laughs) Paul was very aware of the danger that the forces of darkness pose to the Christian and to the church. So before we actually get into our passage this morning, let me ask you, have you ever been under outright demonic attack? Now, please understand, by that, I don't mean that you saw a dragon with two heads breathing fire, you know, or some creepy little girl in a nightdress with an axe in a cemetery by an old farm, right? (laughs) You know, Satan's been very good at convincing us that that's what his attacks look like. Now, I guess my question, the question I want to ask you this morning is, can you identify a demonic attack when you see it or hear it? Now, I can tell you what it's not. It is probably not a hideous monster with sulfurous breath wafting out of its nose, growling threats at you in some ghoulish, guttural voice. I'm not saying Satan can't attack that way, and his demons don't, but it's rare. No, just as our verses 14 and 15 in our passage this morning say, I think it's much more likely that the forces of evil will come at us as something good something beautiful, an angel of light, or a servant of righteousness. So what do you think? If these forces of evil don't actually normally really come at us with a pitchfork and bared fangs foaming at the mouth, what will it look like? What does it look like? What is their more common MO? In other words, what battlefield are they likely to choose when they attack you? Well, if you study the devil in Scripture, and not Hollywood, you'll see that his preferred arena of attack is exactly what we see in verse 3 here in our passage, chapter 11. Paul says, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your minds will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. What was Paul's concern here? Was it that the saints in Corinth were just going to kind of sort of drift away because they were lazy, because of some spiritual entropy or apathy? No. No, he was concerned that just as Eve was deceived, that's something that happened in her mind, so too the Corinthian faithful would be led astray by an external, unseen force led astray from their pure and sincere devotion to Christ. Presumably by the same deceiver, the same devil or devils. And how was this leading astray going to happen? Well, look at verse 4. They proclaimed a different Jesus, a different spirit, and a different gospel. In short, They were going to lead people astray by false teaching. How did the devil attack Eve? By distorting God's truth. How was the devil attacking the church at Corinth? By distorting God's truth. This is a battle for the mind. And Satan didn't stop after Corinth. This is a battle for your mind. This is always the devil's preferred battleground. Not a cemetery not a 
abandoned cabin in the woods. It's your mind that he's after. Look at verse 6. Paul, as he begins to defend his apostleship here, says right out, even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. A predator always goes for the jug jugular. Well, spiritually speaking, your mind is your jugular. And your enemy knows it. And that's where he's going to go. Now, this isn't a new theme in Paul's letter. Look at chapter 10, verse 3. Paul says, For, the, for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. It's a battle for the mind. Now Paul knows this isn't just a battle of ideas and ideologies. This is a battle of unseen spiritual forces between the powers of darkness and God's forces at Corinth. Satan attacked Eve. And then Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. But the devil hasn't been caged yet, and he is still on the loose. He's still on the prowl, and he still seeks to attack and to destroy. And where is that battlefield? It's the mind, always. The mind is the gateway to the heart and every facet of your life. And we are faced daily with a, with a choice, especially in our media-driven, entertainment-driven world. You can either feed your mind on the lies of the devil, or you can choose to feed on God's truth. What are you looking at? What are you listening to? What are you watching? What are you reading? Where does your mind dwell? That's the question. Paul says in verse 6, I may be untrained and unskilled in public speaking, but I am not untrained in knowledge. Do you remember how Paul got his training and where? It's in Galatians chapter 1. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 11, Paul says, The gospel that I preach is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then there in Galatians 1, he goes on and explains how he was in the Arabian desert for three years, receiving direct revelation from Jesus Christ himself. Paul did not preach the gospel of Peter. He preached the gospel of the Jesus Christ who we worship. Paul was willing to concede that he was not a professional public speaker, but he wasn't willing to give an inch on what really did matter. He said, I have knowledge. I don't lack in that area. Paul's point was, I know God. Not, I, I have a bunch of facts about God in my head. Paul said, let him who boast, boasts, boast that he understands and knows God. These false teachers came into Corinth and they were leading people astray. And one of the ways that they were poisoning the minds of the Christians at Corinth was they were trying to turn the Corinthians against Paul. One of the ways they did that was to claim that Paul didn't really love them. And one of the pieces of evidence that they used to prove that Paul didn't love the Corinthians was that Paul wouldn't even accept charity from the Corinthians. Look at verse 7. Paul says, did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel to you free of charge? I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I didn't burden anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, that's an oath. This boast of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you? No, God knows that I do. The Corinthians were actually being led to believe that Paul's refusal of their financial support was a sign that Paul didn't love them. I mean, Satan's going to use any angle he can find. To our 21st century ears, that sounds pretty petty and a little bit odd. Now, it does help if you understand 
the Greco-Roman world and the patron-client relationship that was very common in the Roman Empire. I mean, the, the patron-client expectation was, or practice was an expectation that was held throughout the world. If you came into a city and you were a person of some import, but you lacked means, it would be natural for you to seek a patron in that city who could support you financially and take care of you. But when Paul got to Corinth, he didn't do that. Now, the, the practice of patronage was common throughout the Roman era, where the patron was somebody who was of a higher class than the client. The patron would meet some of the financial needs of the client. But they were always hierarchical relationships. One person from a higher class to another person, or if the people were in the same class, the patron would be somebody with a lot more money and a lot more power than the client. Even in the world of slavery, when somebody got freed, the freed man would almost always become the client of his former master. It was a top-down relationship. And the expectation was that there were always strings attached to the money. If the patron was running for office, then the client was expected to support him and vote for him. And the number of clients and the standing of the client gave prestige to the patron. So you can imagine what kind of prestige a patron would get if they were Paul's patron. Each morning at dawn, the clients were supposed to come to the patron's house and greet him, at which time he would give them errands to run for him during the day. Well, it's not hard to see why Paul would avoid a system like this. Paul was the spiritual father of the believers at Corinth. A place like Corinth with the factions and the, you know, the, the gang mentality that existed there, Paul just decided when he got there it was best not to accept their money. I mean, accepting money from one patron, what would, do, what would that do to all the other believers at Corinth? could get very messy, and Paul just decided not to do it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul made it clear that he had a right to accept money from the Corinthians. But in chapter 9, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 12, Paul says, Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel. Paul knew he had a right to accept money at Corinth, but he knew also he couldn't do it. It would get too messy. So when he had needs, he worked as a tent maker. He worked with his hands. He says here in verse 7, I humbled myself so that you might be exalted. Paul was willing to lower himself to manual labor, leather work, an occupation that was seen as menial and common. Remember, he was a Pharisee. He came out of some means and class. But he chose to do that so that he could lift the Corinthians up. So he could present the gospel to them without any kind of a roadblock or hindrance. He says, I did this so that you might be exalted, so I could present you betrothed to Jesus Christ so that you might be lifted up and seated with him at the right hand of authority. Paul abased himself so that they would be exalted. In other words, through Paul's poverty, the Corinthians were made rich. Paul's model was Christ. Remember chapter 8, verse 9? Paul says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he became poor for your sake so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. That was Paul's model. Can you see how different that is, <clears throat> excuse me, from the false teachers who had come into Corinth? Like all false teachers, what they wanted was money and prestige and reputation. Paul's single goal was that he could give these people the gospel free of charge so that they might be sincerely and purely devoted to Jesus Christ. So he chose to humble himself rather than take their money. And so he basically says in this paragraph, no, I didn't take your money, but what's so wrong with that? Did I, com did I commit a sin by not taking your money? I accepted support from other churches so that I could preach to you the gospel without charge. Now, he makes it clear that he's not about to depart from that strategy. He's going to stick to it. He says in, at the end of verse 9, so I refrain and will refrain from burdening you in any way. 
In fact, he goes on to say in verse 10, as the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you. God knows I do. Many question Paul for his refusing their money. But Paul presents it as a boast, actually. Now remember, as we saw last week, Alexis said that this passage is often called the fool speech. Chapter 11 and halfway through chapter 12, Paul does what he calls foolish boasting in order to try to convince the believers at Corinth that he is in fact God's envoy and that the false teachers are in fact not sent from God. So here in verse 10, Paul boasts about not accepting money in Corinth. And his boast is not just limited to the city of Corinth, but to the entire region of Achaia, where Corinth was found. The false apostles were greedy for money. And Paul was adamant about distinguishing himself from those guys by not accepting money. Now, a lot of people at Corinth, they saw that refusal as a rejection of friendship and love, and so Paul just affirms his love for them. And he does it in a form of an oath. He says, as the truth of Christ is in me, I love you. God knows that I love you. Just because people misunderstood Paul and his motives did not mean Paul was going to change his tactics. Look at verse 12. It says, And what I am doing I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that their boasted mission, in their boasted mission they work on the same terms as we do. The false apostles were undoubtedly receiving money from patrons in Corinth and were trying to convince the Corinthians that they were not only apostles, as Paul was, but that they were better than Paul because they loved the people. And Paul's resolute, you know, he's resolute in his decision. He's going to remain financially independent from these people. It doesn't matter what they say. Paul knows that his stance will eventually undermine these false apostles and that they will be proved as greedy and Paul is genuine. Now again, this is not Paul defending himself. This is Paul defending the gospel. If these false teachers were able to discredit Paul, they would be able to discredit the message of the gospel. And Paul doesn't want that to happen. So Paul's determined to undermine their claim any way he can. And so now, for the rest of the passage, he just takes the gloves off. There's no pretense here. Up to this point, Paul's been pretty tame. Back in chapter 2, he called these guys peddlers of God's word. All right, and that's a reference to their insincerity and to their, their greed. Here in chapter 11, in verse 5, he refers to them tongue-in-cheek as super-apostles, or some of your translations say most eminent apostles. But now in verse 13, he bears down with the full force of his apostolic authority, and he says in verse 13, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ, and no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants, Satan's servants, also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. That's pretty straightforward. Unlike so many today, Paul was not willing to sacrifice truth at the altar of tolerance and unity. As we saw back in verse 4, these men proclaimed a different Jesus, a different spirit, and a different gospel. So Paul denounces them with language in measure with what is at stake. He calls them what they are. False apostles, he says, deceitful workmen, servants of Satan. He literally calls them by a brand new word, pseudo, pseudopostoloi. Literally means pseudo-apostles. You won't find it anywhere in the Greek up to this point in history. And it's used nowhere else in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit invented a new word for these guys. Fake apostles. That's the essence of what they were. They are not the real thing. They were never sent out by Christ. They are simply masquerading as servants of, of Christ. Pretenders in disguise. Wolves in sheep's clothing. Servants of Satan with a mask of righteousness. Paul calls them deceitful workmen. These guys are agents of the devil. And they do as the devil does. The father of lies. They deceive. 
Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul calls himself a workman and he says, we all together work to build up God's house, the church. And then he says, you need to be careful how you build into that because you will be judged how you build into the church. Build the church up, don't tear the church down. In verse 17 of 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy. And you, plural, you are God's temple, the church. If anyone destroys the church, God will destroy him or her. And that's why in our passage this morning, Paul says at the end of verse 15, their end will correspond to their deeds. Paul's not pulling any punches. Who judges these guys? It's going to be Jesus Christ himself who will judge them, who will preside over their destruction. He determines the final end of the servants of Satan. And Paul says many times that that, saint, that sentence will involve destruction, just as they are destroying God's temple, the church. In Matthew 7, Jesus gives us a glimpse of this, the, the fearful judgment that awaits false teachers. In verse 15 of Matthew 7, Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who come in sheep's clothing, but are inwardly ravenous wolves. Later in that passage, in verse 21, Jesus makes a solemn promise about these guys. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father will enter. In other words, the person who does what God said to do, the person who follows God's instruction, wears God's instruction, the person who knows God's word and does it. Not those who make it up as they go. Not those who try to fit the gospel to fit man's logic or to fit the teaching of scripture to fit comfortably with our culture to make it more acceptable or more palatable. Jesus went on to say in verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? And in your name perform many miracles to which Jesus will say, away from me. I don't know you, you evildoers. In Philippians 3.19, Paul said about the enemies of the cross, false teachers, their end is destruction because their, their belly is their God and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. See, these people are not just mistaken. Paul calls them servants of Satan. And destruction is their end. John said in 1 John chapter 4, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. See, false prophets and false teachers are not just intellectually mistaken. They are in league with spirits. Test the spirits, Paul, John said. That's why John said, you need to be on your toes, listening carefully. Well, how can we do that? Saints, this is why it is so important for us to study the Scriptures, to know what God is saying. It's not just in the first century that we see the activity of Satan in the form of false teachers. It started in the Garden of Eden, and it is alive and well today. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Paul wrote 1 Timothy to a young pastor in Ephesus to instruct him as to how to deal with false teachers. That's what 1 Timothy is about, false teachers in Ephesus. That's the purpose of the book of 1 Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves. Wow, we've, heard, we've seen that word before. The Corinthians were being led astray from a pure and sincere devotion to Christ. Here it says, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared with, as with a heart, hot iron. Make no mistake about it, false teaching is demonic. 
Now, false teachers might be doing it unwittingly. They might not know because their consciences are so seared and because they are so deceived. But the devil knows. The devil is very intentional about it, and his demons have a plan. That's why Paul said in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, we do things the way God said, he said. We're going to forgive the way God said, in order that Satan might not outwit us. Outwit us. This is the problem with the mind. He said, for we are not unaware of Satan's schemes. Notice the word schemes. This is not a full frontal attack by some hideous monster. No, schemes are secret. They're hidden. They're clandestine. They're under a cloak. They're in disguise. They're much more subtle than Hollywood would like to make you believe. If Hollywood was to make a movie about the way Satan actually attacks us, it would be a very boring movie. I asked at the beginning of the message, would you be able to recognize a demonic attack if you saw it? In other words, how do you know when Satan is targeting you? What do you think he wants? Did you know that you have something that everyone wants? Quoting my seminary professor, Dr. Willard Aldrich, somebody that both Brenda and I got to sit under, he says, yes, you do have something everyone wants. The butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker want it. The banker, too. Your friends and relatives want it. God wants it. The devil wants it. What's more, they want it badly. In fact, they want it badly enough to fight you for it. What you've got that everybody wants is the prize of every political campaign. Everyone, everyone who runs for political office has to have this. It's the goal of ideological warfare. It's the victor's crown in advertising, and it's the key to golden treasures in commerce and business. Your boyfriend or girlfriend or fiancé or spouse wants it. Your parents need to know they have it. Or your kids are constantly longing for access to it. In fact, without it, there can be neither love nor hope. Satan came into the Garden of Eden to get it, and Jesus came to earth to win it and to transform it. Now, of course, what they're talking about here is your mind. It is the gateway to every other facet in your life. What you believe, what you love, what you trust, what you hope for, what you cherish, what you seek, what you fear, what you avoid, what you spend your time on and what you spend your money for. All of it is determined from beginning to end by how you think. See, Satan doesn't need to tempt you to commit some great act of evil if he can just get you to stop thinking with the mind of Christ. Bible study is not some religious exercise we do to earn brownie points with God. No. Understanding and studying truth is your lifeline to the mind of Christ. This is the foundation that allows you to build your life on a rock rather than shifting sand. This is the anchor that keeps us from drifting away from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. This is the armor of God that protects us from the schemes of the devil. Now, we work hard every day to keep germs and bacteria at bay in our homes, in our personal hygiene. We have to realize that demonic forces are no less insidious and a lot more dangerous than germs. We live in a country that is so blessed that it gives us the illusion that we can live life just fine without God. You know, if we just go to church once a week, put in an appearance, then we can just go on living our lives the way we've always lived our lives with ourselves at the center. All the while, Satan gently stroking us to sleep, right? Reminding us, there is no spiritual realm. There are no demons. There's no hell. Darwin was right. Relax. Hell was just made up to make you afraid. Go to sleep. Don't fret. To 
to which Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. If this wasn't prevalent, why did Paul talk so much about it? If demons just attack somewhere over there in Africa somewhere, why did Paul talk about it so much? He says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all, to stand. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one, his lies, and take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Sounds like this is a real and imminent danger, doesn't it? Saints, we are at war. This is not a time of peace. Satan wants your mind and the mind of everyone you love. And I just want to know, have you joined the battle? See, there is no sideline in the struggle. You are either in the battle, and by that I mean you are in the Word of God, and you are working intentionally to get the Word of God into your mind and into your heart, or you are being dragged down into error by the spirit of the age. And the lies of the devil in our culture are starting to sound reasonable to you. And even preferable to that narrow, legalistic Bible. Right? See, Satan's forces may not attack you with polished horns and bared fangs. They're much more likely to come as an angel of light. Servants of righteousness with demonic ideas dressed up like truth. Now, I hope you have the good sense. I hope we all have the good sense not to play around with Ouija boards or tarot cards or palm reading or horoscopes. I mean, what do all those things have in common? The person who uses those things is looking for truth. Where are they looking for truth? From the angel of death, from the spirits of darkness. That's where they're looking for truth. How dumb can you be? So I hope we know that those things are off the table for a Christian. You can get yourself into some really serious demonic trouble playing around with that stuff. You know, it's probably much more likely that Satan's going to come at you in a much more insidious, hidden way. See, we know what poop looks like. Sorry for being so crass. but You know what poop looks like. Satan's not going to be able to... This is for the teenagers in the, in the room. You're not, Satan's not going to be able to just force feed this to you. Right? No, he's going to dress it up, make it look good. Right? He's going he's to give you a, a Reese's cup that's really a feces cup. Got to speak to everybody in the room. Jim, that was for the teenagers. <laughs> Not far off, huh? And, and the sad thing about it is we're willing to pay for it. We're willing to spend our money on cable that gives us feces cups and music and books and magazines. Peter said, be sober-minded. Sober-minded. Be watchful. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to destroy. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brethren throughout the world. Throughout the world. Satan, I do not think that I am overstating the demonic realm this morning. You don't have to be attacked face to face by some demon to be influenced by the pervasiveness of demonic ideas in our culture. As Tim Challies puts it, the Christian faith is much more than facts, much more than doctrine, but it can never be less. 
Christianity is dependent upon the truths of God's Word. And it's dependent upon us receiving the truths of God's Word. Every Christian is responsible to learn sound doctrine, to be trained in the truth, to be able to discern error when it comes along. Every Christian is individually responsible to study sound doctrine and to learn it for yourself. Paul told Timothy, if you put these things before the brethren, if you put these teachings before the brethren, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ, being trained in the words of faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. 1 Timothy 4.6 Every Christian needs to read and study and know the Bible and the truth that it contains. Place yourself under good teaching. I don't just mean here at church, but in small groups. Alexis is trying to put together some missional groups that study the Word of God and do the Word of God. But also in good books, good solid teaching, solid commentaries. We're studying 2 Corinthians now. I still don't know where we're going in the future, but when we go there, get a commentary on that book and study along with us. Sharon always puts in the, in the, in the bulletin the passage we're going to have the next week. You know what to study that week to prepare your heart and your mind to receive the teaching that we give so that you can tell me when I'm in error. You can come up and grab me, pull me off to the side and say, you're wrong, Matt. It's happened before. <laughs> It'll happen again. And I praise God for people who are biblically minded and willing to do that for me. We check ourselves. We check each other. You need to know the truth. The battle for the mind is real. And I know when I say it like that, it sounds like drudgery. Please understand, it's not. God's Word is perfect. It revives the soul. It brings joy to the heart. It gives insight for living. It's better than gold and sweeter from, than honey, straight from the honeycomb. That's from Psalm 19, if you want to look at it later. Paul was concerned that the saints at Corinth would be led astray by, demo, by demonic lies because they didn't know God's word. I'll be real honest with you. I've never been more concerned about the church in America and our lackluster interest in the word of God. Hopefully I'm not talking about you. We are one generation away from a dead church in America. Just like Canada. Just like France. Just like England. If you're not in God's word and you want to be, please come talk to me. I'll give you some ideas. If you're a man, I'll meet with you. I'll give you two months meeting with you to get you started on a way to study God's word in a systematic fashion. Now, if you're a lady, I don't meet with ladies. I think scripture is clear. Men disciple men, women disciple women. But come to me and I'll try to find somebody to meet with you. I know some of you thought I just had a Mike Pence moment there. I agree with Mike Pence. I don't counsel women. I don't minister one-on-one -on -one with women. Now, if you are in God's Word and you're consistently studying God's Word, catch it. If you are in God's Word and you're consistently studying God's Word, let me ask you another question. Are you meeting on a regular basis with somebody who wants to? If you're not, come see me or call me. I can help make some connections. I can help you find somebody to disciple, to meet with. Discipleship relationship doesn't have to go on for years and years. It can. You can set an end to it. We're going to meet six times. I'm going to get you started. Or whatever, you want, whatever time limit you want to put on it. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to help somebody else. I know people are afraid. They're going to ask me something I don't know. Good. And you can say, I don't know. I'll go look. And that will force you deeper into the Word of God. And so as you're instructing them, they're instructing you in iron sharpening iron. And the growth and the benefit is mutual. Paul said, finally, brothers, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, 
If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. There is no better way to do that than to immerse your mind in the Word of God. Let's pray. Father, we are faced with a battle we can't fight. We need you. You said in the Old Testament that you are a mighty warrior, that you fight on our behalf, and so we ask you to fight against those who fight against us, and I'm speaking spiritually here. God, that you would thwart and tear down the arguments and the strongholds and the, and the, and the philosophies that Satan would want to build into our hearts and into our minds. Help us, Lord. Win that battle for us. Give us the good sense to turn off the tube and open up your word. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.